Well, welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub. We are fortunate to have a great founder and a friend of mine with us tonight, Genevieve Thiers, the founder of Sitter City. Glad to have you here, Jen. Thanks, Pat. Nice to be here. Great to have you. Thanks for being here. Now, we just talked about the Internet of Things in our uh, opening act, and uh, so we're going to something more relatable here mm. for most of us, at least for me, um, which is uh, Sitter City. Great company. You started out of college. Look forward to hearing your story. But for those who haven't used it or don't know it or may not have kids or, or, or sit, what is Sitter City? Sure. Uh, Sitter City is America's first and largest network to connect parents with caregivers online. So we have five divisions. Child care, pet care, senior care, home care, and tutoring, and millions of users uh, internationally now. Uh, we actually have a U.S. division, but also a Canadian division and a U.K. division. So that's wow. been fun. How exciting. Yeah, it's great. We also have a corporate program that we're really proud of. So we have a consumer level, but companies have been purchasing Sitter City in bulk uh, for all of their employee, all of their you know employees and their employee base. So that's been nice, too. We serve thousands of companies uh, with our partner, Bright Horizons, and the U.S. Department of Defense as well. So you, um, so if I'm a sitter or I'm a caregiver of any type, let's start with sitter since it's in the name. Sure. How do I, how do I use Sitter City? Well, it's pretty easy. Uh, it takes the model of a dating site. So you basically go on and you post a profile. But then what you want to do is you want to be very active as well in responding to the jobs that parents post because there's really two ways to use it. You can either search or you can post a job. So it's, it's really great. You have a lot of detail in every sitter profile, everything from, you know, obviously their name and contact information to videos, background checks, references, parent feedback, uh, cool things like videos you can watch. Uh, so it's really very detailed. And uh, a lot of our sitters, um, you know, really do a great job as well. We have a, a trust-based algorithm, which really counts uh, for a lot with moms. And uh, a lot of them really fight to get the background checks done and make sure their profile is complete and that they have a couple of pictures. And they do whatever they can to really get up at the top and just be amazing sitters. Well, it's great. You know, I, I remember when we first had kids, my oldest is 10, and I remember the, there was a young woman at DePaul who was brokering them. And, and, you know, it was almost like people wanted to bribe her because they were having trouble in the city finding good sitters. <laughs> that used to be me. Yes. So, I was just. <laughs> it was. I mean, people were there was some supply demand thing, and it was yeah. it was hard to hard to make that connect. So yeah. interesting to know it was inspired by data. We'll get to that, which is fun. Sure. So where did the idea come from? Well, you did this before you were had kids, so this wasn't. You have young kids, so. Yeah, I do. Well, like you, I have twins. Yeah, two-year-old twins, which is why, by the way, I'm really happy to be here, to be in a room full of people that actually will listen to what I say. <laughs> it's amazing. I spend my life like, put down the cookie. Put it down. Put it down, you know. <laughs> and somebody here would actually put down the cookie. Anyway, uh, you know, um, I'm the oldest of seven kids, so my parents are here tonight. They're oh, actually great. here. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. <laughs> and, um, you know, I have a twin sister, and then there are three kids in the middle, and then another set of twins at the bottom. So we've pretty much been babysitting since we were born. <laughs> so that's been fun. So I guess it was in my blood. Um, you know, we really, my sister and I, uh, had a monopoly on our local development, and then we just went from there. We were musicians as well, and so, you know, gradually, you know, as we began to, to you know, so did you grow, start it, did you start it, I mean, was this, this, this started out of college? Or yeah, you exactly. So, so the, um, the idea came to me when I was basically about to graduate. I was sitting there staring out my dorm room window. And, and this I saw is Boston this. College? Boston College, yeah. Chestnut back in, Hill. Boston. I know, very hilly campus, yes. you know, and, and uh, back in 2000. And uh, there was like 200 steps in front of my I was dorm. thinking about where I was going to drink beer, and you were thinking about starting your business. All right, so there's a difference. <laughs> So you're so here you oh, are. There's you're, a story though. Yeah. You're in, you're in college, and why yeah. are you thinking about this problem as a college student? Well, there are conflicting stories on this. My parents would tell you it's because I did not want to go back and be a bagger at the local Gennardi's. <laughs> but really, I mean, I wanted to do something big. I just didn't know what it was, but I wanted to do something big. I was trained in opera. I, I've been a singer my whole life, a performer. I didn't want to wait tables. So I'm sitting there. I'm about to graduate. You know, I remember I was terrified, too, because I had to sing the anthem at graduation for like 12,000 people. And anyway, I saw this nine months pregnant mother walking up these steps 
posting flyers for a sitter. And I remember thinking, well, she should not be doing that. It did not look like a good situation anyway. But when I went out and took the flyers from her um, to post them for her, you know, to send her home, um, I began thinking, why isn't there just one place in this city or any city, or frankly in the world, where you can go to find all of the caregivers around you and just quickly screen them? You know, it's really a simple process. It's just the, you know, the background check is the most obvious thing, but calling the references and doing an interview. So that's really what I built. Uh, Sitter City is just kind of a mashup of a nanny agency and Match.com and Monster.com, those three models just kind of smooshed together. And did you ever, uh, so when you started it, had you had a nanny agency before this? Had you been a nanny? No, I was been an utterly, entrepreneur? I, I was utterly and completely clueless. I was an opera major. <laughs> So anyone can do it, folks. Uh, you would I, be my first opera major here at Founders. Yes, and I'm proud. I'm proud of that. <laughs> we need representation badly. Uh, it's a very small world opera. But, you know, I, I actually knew absolutely nothing about business, except what I learned from babysitting. You know, when I was really little, I actually was quite good at, you know, like getting from job to job and oldest, convincing moms. Oldest mom of seven is part of your, I, I would assume it's part of your job as being the oldest of seven. Part of your DNA, you got to convince people that you know what you're doing, you know, and fast. So I never taken a business class in my life. I came out, I kid you not, I did not know what a recession was. I did not know what it was. So I came out, you know, I was singing like Carmen on the weekends and just going, this is great, I'm going to build this, I'm going to build it. And so, you know, I went to the SBA, they were great, they sat me down, gave me some forms, you know, kind of got me started. Talked to a bunch of friends, found a friend of mine who was a developer, another friend who was a designer, literally sat on their floor and just drew what I wanted mm -hmm. and said, please build this. And um, I did manage as well to get a job at IBM as a, it was an editor of technical manuals of all things. So uh, I was also an English okay. minor. So, <laughs> so you're, so you graduated from BC, yeah. you're working at IBM, editing right. technical manuals by day. And singing working opera on, at night. Singing opera at night. <laughs> right. And then when do you work on Sitter City? Well, it was mostly, you know, nights and weekends for Sitter City, too. So it was, it was great. I mean, they did build the product for me. I did a lot of testing of the product. And then what I, what I ended up doing was I just went out and got 20,000 flyers that said, you know, do you want to make 10 to $15 an hour? Be a sitter. And I would literally go to the colleges all over Boston. There are 33 colleges. Yeah, right. Hospitals and... and yeah. Colleges are just packed. Oh, they were the best. And when I do, because I look like a student, I put it in my backpack and I would sit there and wait for someone to come out of the door. And then somebody would come out and I'd say, oh, thank you. And I'd just walk in and then I'd flyer the dorm top to bottom. And I would do this like 20 times for all 33 colleges. It was crazy. But I ended up with 600 sitters. And then I took the 30 or so parents I was sitting for, dumped them on. It wasn't really enough, you know, we needed, a, you know, a better balance than that. So I was chasing moms in supermarkets at one point. I remember I was in the frozen food aisle and there's this big group of moms and I just like pitched them in the frozen food aisle. But I mean, it worked, you know, uh, we were able to, you know, well, I was basically, it was just me at that point, was able to get like a critical mass going and then it started to grow. Well, let's, I, I want to explore that. We talk a lot about uh, two-sided networks and how you make a two-sided network or marketplace work here at Founder Stories. But Let's go back in time a little bit because you talked about growing up oldest of seven. Um, did you do entrepreneurial things? Were you out there trying to make money? Some people talk about making money, cutting lawns. Other people, I think Chris Gladwin had like the most sophisticated paper route ever. He had like <laughs> subsidiaries he and distribution would. channels. And, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, you know, my parents are teachers. They did a great job. But, you know, we were always doing a ton of extra jobs. For me, really, it was the babysitting. We had a monopoly, I mean a monopoly, on like our development and the five around it. We would pass each other on the road and the way to jobs and like high five. We made thousands of dollars like every summer. It was great. There was also the singing. Um, you know, I, I would sing every wedding, every funeral that came through. My sister was an organist and a pianist. So um, you learn to sell yourself as well as a performer mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit. You know, it's the same thing, really. You got to get in front of people and you have six seconds to convince them you're good as well. So I did a ton of that. And both of them just combined to really give me a sense of, I guess, practicality about it all. You just have a really great, you know, service and you sell it and you know you learn a lot when you're young with yeah. those jobs i also was big bird and cookie monster 
for a while <laughs> at sorry? Sesame Place. I was Big Bird and Cookie Monster. I really? Was, I sang opera at a macaroni grill for a while. That was terrifying. Um, I'm stronger for that. I was how's a your cookie, How's your Cookie Monster and Big Bird voice? Not very good, unfortunately. I can do a good Prairie Dawn, but I was never, you're not supposed to talk, which was very good. You just walk around in the costumes and, you know, I, I've had every crazy job you can imagine. I was a janitor. <laughs> I was... I was everything. Uh, we did a lot of work, and it was great. It really so you had, so you, had a, you. you had a great, you had the entrepreneurial work ethic going into this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. It was fun. It was great. fun. So here you are out of college. You, you probably didn't think about two-sided networks. You were just thinking about how do I get enough moms and sitters. Right. Um, so talk about finding that first balance. Like, you know, you kind of, you're plastering the place to get sitters. Did you get no. too many sitters to start, too many moms? Like, how did it? Well, Talk about how you made that balance work. It's hard. Two-sided networks are just really ridiculous to build. And I knew from the start I would have to have the right balance. I just didn't know what it was. Was it 10 sitters to every one mom? Was it three sitters to every one mom? So when I first got on, I just threw everybody on there that I possibly could. Um, and for free, too. I mean, like, just anybody I could talk into. I was giving things away, candy, whatever, to get them to do it. And, you know, that worked really well. But I rapidly began to see, um, you know, particularly with Boston, our first market, I began to see right away that people would fall off. If there weren't enough sitters to engage the moms, the moms would leave. If there weren't enough jobs to engage the sitters, they would leave. And I remember, I remember one day I was actually walking by one of those. There used to be these, these really crappy bulletin boards at every college. They really were not nice. And it was where you posted your sitting job. You know, this real high tech, right? And like everything would fall down on the floor and be like walked on. People would terrible. cut a little piece, you'd have to tear it off. Right, right. Those little, it was Pre -torn. just awful. And I remember thinking, ah. And I realized that if I took down those flyers and posted those jobs on the site, that the sitters would stay. So I began literally just going college by college and posting those jobs on the site. So the sitters would stay more often than not and I was able to maintain large bases of them for the parents particularly you know some of the gotcha. very so the sitters moms so to, the sitters were not they they were on if they didn't get a job they kind of drop off. oh yeah they would drop off right away we had a, a window of three months and then they were just gone I mean there was nothing there for them it was so hard to maintain that balance but once I realized that you could sort of artificially pump up the system as long as you weren't charging anyone you know I think the parents so why would were they happy. drop off they how would they leave because there weren't, there weren't jobs. But how did they drop off? Were, they, were you charging them? or? Uh, the sitters, no. And, and actually, that's funny. That's remained to this day. Uh, you know, you don't want to charge your supply, essentially, right. if you supply and demand. You don't want to do that. But you do want to allow them to compete based on merit. Right. Um, not compete based on payment. Compete based on merit. So, you know, we found that, uh, you know, some of them would just sit there dormant, um, but they wouldn't change their account. They'd move. They'd go home. They'd go somewhere else. And, and their email would change, and they were just gone. Um, so it looked like we had more sitters than we so did. That's so I love the story of yeah. taking down the flyers. But unlike taking down the flyers of your competition, you took them down to actually amplify their message. Right, right. It was um, good. Which is great. Now, it's interesting because the Grubhub guys, if you talk to them, what they did was they went and collected menus. Mm -hmm. Right, and they weren't customers. They just put the menus on, so they gave, in this case, uh, you know, food buyers or you know people looking for or to order for delivery and pickup. They gave them enough to be able to go. So you yeah. picked early on. So the, the moms are paying. So you want the moms are the most important part of the market, mm -hmm. and you got to get enough supply for them. So it's an interesting yeah. way, really clever. How long did it take to figure that out? Well. It it took me a couple markets, actually. I mean, I, I saw in Boston that we were somehow succeeding. The ratios were like 10 sitters to every one mom. But then I got my little backpack of flyers, got on a plane, went to Cleveland, and then went to New York. And it was completely different. New so York Cleveland was market two. Cleveland was a market two. It was just was a, it market number two, though, second one you went to? Uh, Cleveland, uh, Cleveland was number two. New York was number three. I kind of opened them at the same time. So why, why Cleveland is your second market? It was utterly haphazard. I wish I had some massive formula for you. My husband's family has an office there and he, and some family and he's like Cleveland's great I'm like sounds good to me I mean I had no rhyme or reason whatsoever I just knew that like you know this was going to work and I was growing it almost like a garden I had some trouble getting funding from the get-go because I think a lot of people just didn't get it uh, you know I, there were a lot of guys I was pitching and and they were great guys but they just didn't they never babysat like I remember one guy was like my wife handles that I, I this sounds great but I have no idea what you're talking about right now 
So that was hard, you know. So I just kept going. See, I would, I would have invested simply off the extortionate <laughs> nanny agency at DePaul. That would have been enough for me. Oh to my gosh, like, it's like two thousand dollars. There had to have been a better way. I'm just shocked no one did it before me. Yeah, it's a lot of money. Okay, so you're, um, so you go to Cleveland. Yeah. Go to New York. What's each experience? Are they similar? I, I, everybody talks nuts. about opening New York is like a different country. <laughs> well, it was. And after, after um, September 11th, it became really hard to break into the dorms. <laughs> I started getting marched out by security. <laughs> it happened a few times. It was awesome. Um, but, you know, I, I, it was completely different. I mean, New York. Handcuffs, people, no handcuffs? No handcuffs, unfortunately. Oh, I would have loved that photo, though. <laughs> that would have been really great. Like, really, like, entrepreneur gives all. <laughs> Five years in jail, you know, like, I don't know. But no, it was just more that, like, you know, I, I don't know. It was different. I mean, Cleveland was a really sleepy town. It took me forever to galvanize. It took me forever to get the moms. And what, finally, once I did, it was like a three-to-one ratio was all that was needed. And then, boom, it was up in the air. Uh, New York, oh, they are picky there. I mean, th they needed, like, a 20-to-one ratio. I mean, like, those moms, they wanted somebody who could, you know, obviously was perfect in every way, but also, like, spoke Mary Korean Poppins. and, yeah, and sang. Some of them would post and must be able to sing. And I remember thinking, this is awesome. I can sing, you know, like, it was just <laughs> so funny. I mean, like, they, it was, just, New York moms were picky. And so, you know, I had to have a bigger ratio there. And it just, it just really fanned out eventually. And it changes too, you know, uh, city by city, I would have an opening ratio and it would work and then there was this viral burst and the, it would just grow to thousands and thousands of parents. And was it purely organic or did you do things to sort of promote Hardly virality? anything. I did a little press and a little print, but that's the thing about moms. And that's why I love building things for moms. This viral marketing that you can get from a good mom base, right. it's incredible. And so that happens to be a niche I really love. But Wow, I mean, and now it's tighter. It's interesting. Like our best markets are really two to one, you know, two really? to one ratio. It just changes as you grow. But back then, they needed to know there was just so many they could find the perfect one that spoke Korean and wasn't allergic to cats and would sit for a fish too. I mean, it was crazy some of the stuff we got in there. <laughs> so, so go back to the the early market there and mm -hmm. um, talk about finding a revenue model. Was it? Yeah. Did, how, how did that? <laughs> Did you start with a revenue model right away? Did you put a revenue model in later? Did it evolve? It evolved. Uh, so my, my way of finding revenue model was just about as sophisticated as everything else I've done, which was that I went to the local, I babysat for the head of the Newton Mothers Forum, which was this group of like 120 great moms. And I bought them pizza and gave them probably the worst survey anyone's ever given. It was like, you're not supposed to be very direct in surveys. It was like, what would you pay? I mean, it was awful. But I, I basically gave them this survey and a lot of pizza, and they felt sorry for me, so they filled it out. And in the end, I took the average, and some of them said I would pay nothing for this. Some of them said I'd pay $100 for this. So I averaged it out to like 40, and it was 40 a year. Then it was like 40 and $5 a month, and then it was, oh, it has gone through massive iterations, probably over 100 at this point to find the right price point. And I think we did hit where we should have. I mean, yeah, you go in and you talk to investors, and they're like, you should have started higher. First of all, how was I supposed to know? I just wanted them to find something that made them comfortable. Right. And getting their trust was so important that I had to get the price point right so that it didn't scare them away, because enough already scared them about the internet. But two, it's like you got to just go with what they're saying. You got to surf what they're trying to get. And their, their pain point was high. It was morphine, but still, they weren't going to pay anything near what they'd pay a nanny. So the the first price you put out. So when you was there any price when you first started? It was it was thirty nine ninety nine a year. When yeah. you first started. When we first started for moms, for and, parents. And did you find that price point? Did it, was it easy to get them to sign up? Did it? It slow was down? a little too easy. So then we made it thirty nine ninety nine and five dollars a month, and then we made it ten dollars a month, and it just changed so drastically from there. One, one question, just. Somebody yeah. asked it on the um, uh, on the online here, but the question is: Are most of yours sort of one-off babysitting, or are they trying to find a regular person? You'd be surprised. The majority of our sitters are actually nannies. Um, they're they're looking for either after-school jobs, which tend to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and at least four to six hours in a chunks of that for us qualifies as a nanny job, or they're looking for full-time nanny jobs. So that's another interesting thing, which is really brand stretch. We started for babysitters, but by 2004, a couple years in, we saw that 
parents were breaking it to find pet sitters and breaking it to find somebody for grandma. So that's when we built out the other divisions. It was very organic. I mean, often they would break it to do X, Y, or Z, and we'd just build it. I mean, it was funny. So Sitter City is actually an interesting name. I still do love it. I think it gets the point across. But we actually have, again, child care, pet care, senior care, home care, and tutoring. You know, which is random. You know, you, you run the full to, life cycle. We really do. We really run the entire life cycle. It's funny. That's interesting. And people use this all the way through. Talk about how you got trust. So, I mean, we all talk about, you know, if you're a startup and you say to somebody, well, buy our product, and they're like, well, who the heck are you? And why yeah. should I, you know, make my business rely on you? You have an even bigger one, which is why should I trust my child with this person that you have a profile on? Yeah. Uh, given all the mistrust people have of profiles on the internet. So how do you overcome that trust factor in what has to be one of the highest trust transactions a person yeah. can do? When I look back, it's almost mind-bending that we were able to do it, to convince moms that it was safe to find your caregiver online. It is actually, I'll say this you know, full out, it is safer than hiring the girl next door. You're not going to run a background check on her, see parent feedback, blah, blah, blah. You're not going to see any of the algorithmic stuff that makes her so great. But the fact that we were able to do it, and here's what really happened. Um, I didn't go in with some huge press plan. It ended up being PR that catapulted us to the place that we're at now and won us that trust. But I didn't go in with a plan. It just happened to be that one of the moms I sat for was a producer on a local TV show. And she told the other six moms that were there, producers are always moms. <laughs> They're always moms, and they always desperately need childcare. So that was great. And so she told those six moms. They told six moms at another network. And I was just getting booked like that. It was crazy. Um, so I built the site pretty much on press alone for four or five so, years. So, so talk, talk about this for a minute, because I think mm -hmm. this is an interesting strategy. You had, um, let's go to kind of the headlines on this, which mm -hmm. is, when you started with a lot of your press, um, I think you at one point were in the Today Show? Yeah, so around 04, things began to really take off. I, I became the child care expert for the Today Show, but it was through iVillage. So I was iVillage's babysitting expert and then bounced over to Today Show because NBC bought iVillage. So that was just a stroke of luck. So I would do all these segments with Al Roker that were just awesome, like sitter stealing and nanny napping and bonuses. And I mean, it was fascinating. They couldn't get enough. There was a lot to say. Um, so yeah, and we also ended up on The View twice and Ellen and uh, we did everything. And, how, and how, did that, how did that come about? Well, it was all just organic through this network of producers that I was finding nannies for. So anytime I met a producer, they were always frantic. So I'd say, oh, here, you know, go into the database, find yourself some care. And then they would love it so much, you know, that they would ask me questions. I, I helped so many of them through this nanny didn't work out, find a new one. That, you know, I just generally, it's funny, I'm probably the only person they'll pick up a call from because of that trust built up. So that organic network was great. I also became very good at figuring out exactly what the right pitch should be. They have no time, producers, that you have to hand them the perfect pitch on a platter. So, so talk about this for a minute, because yeah. you've become a third degree black belt at this. You're the ninja <laughs> of, of, of startup PR. Ninja. Um, awesome. What would your, like if you were teaching a little mini workshop here to our, our aspiring wow. entrepreneurs, and you were to say the three things or the one thing or whatever it is, if you're trying to get, like, what, what would your advice be based on this, the success you've had? Besides, you've got to get sitters for them, because that seems already taken. That's yeah, no, absolutely. Getting sitters for them is something kind of unusual, though. Whatever your service is, there's always something you can do. I would honestly say, it's, I think it's what I just said, you've got to serve them the entire story on a platter. We would have more broad-based barrages of these press kits going out that said, here are 30 stories you could run that our users have asked for on the site. This story, 42 of our moms asked for. This story, 17 of our moms asked for. We'd break it out by city. We would actually say, you know, like, oh my goodness, in, th in Boston, this many moms want to know. That's awesome to them. They'll pick the best one and they'll run the story. And they'll, they'll want to know if they can get an exclusive on it. So we were very sophisticated there. But then for the big, big ones, you know, like Ellen, The View, Today Show, CBS Morning Show, I mean, you just want to watch like a hawk what they're doing and pitch constantly and charmingly. You, you want to be charming and funny and great every time you meet them. You want to kind of get into the point where you're taking them out for drinks every time you come in and laughing over stuff. You know their kid's birthday, you send them presents. And then the minute you see one story go up and you have a response to it, you hit. You say, I can come back on and talk about that. When Jude Law um, 
cheated on Sienna Miller with the nanny. I was right there. I was like, let's talk about this. Let's talk. How cute is too cute? And it was awesome. <laughs> it got massive pickup. And we got so much press. So you just have to be there. And controversy is good. You got to be able to work on your feet because it can turn against you if you're not on your toes. But we made that the funniest segment ever. Like, All right, so I have to know for our founder, sorry, it's how cute is too cute? <laughs> What's the answer? We let our moms answer that. And, and basically what, what came out more from that was, you know, whenever you're online, on social media or whatever, don't post pictures in a tank top that's this low. You know, don't post your, your picture on the beach. Don't do it. You know, don't have crazy emails like, you know, yeah, sexy swim, kitten 14 at Yahoo. <laughs> Just don't do it, right? It, plain and simple, stupid yeah, stuff. Yeah, the beach shot, you know, is never held up next to other beach shots. It always yeah, looks right. like, you know, here they are with my child, and then <laughs> here they are, you know, you just doesn't, the context <laughs> switch doesn't work. Common sense stuff, you know, right, that so what's, was really what was your was biggest about. story, like, if you had to say, like, the moment that we made it was when this PR thing happened, what was it? What yeah, was it was the Today Show, and it was this amazing piece by Mike Leonard, um, and it was a four-minute piece, um, Matt Lauer introduced it, we taped it uh, in our office, which was at 213 West Institute at that point, and it was just four straight minutes on our revolution to change the caregiving world. And I was singing, I sang The Hills Are Alive, um, <laughs> which somehow seemed to help with the trust factor. We were wandering through the office, they did this cutaway about babysitting through the ages, I mean, it was massive. And what it really did, I mean, yes, it catapulted us. It was, we, were, we were frantic in the office to not go into brownout because we would had a view incident where we did go into brownout because we had so many users. What it really did was it said babysitting is serious business. I mean, I, I had had to tiptoe around that for a long time. And after that interview, I would go in confident. I'd be like, yeah, I'm here. This is a billion dollar industry. Listen up, it's great. You know, and before that, I always felt like I had to apologize. And I'm really glad that happened mm. because Never apologized after that. I never did once again. You can tell you're good. How cute is too cute? Babysitting is big business. These are all things big that people, business. Are, people are going to click on. Good. <laughs> all right, so you talked about early on it was hard to raise money because apparently the men didn't understand it. it was part of it. I get that. I don't, I don't personally. It was the market. It was, right, so, yeah. they, so they're not getting it. So how do you make the business work? Because you got to pay your bills. Well, uh, really what I did was pretty much anything that would work. <laughs> So um, I remember, first of all, obviously getting the users on the site, but then, you know, the site would break, and thankfully, you know, when I was, when I was building Sitter City, I was actually, I went on Match.com just to study the model. It really was just to study the model. I, I think you had a friend study the model. Well, yes, to find a friend to study the model. I no, friend. I was just on Match, like, hey, how does this, this work? Is a, by the way, this is a good story because you want to know how you meet your partner in more ways than one. Yes. <laughs> So I had a profile on Match, which and when had, is this? this is 2001, I just out of college, had a profile on Match. No, how, how, no far, how far are you in the business? Oh gosh, a year in, a year okay. in, right? 600 users, 30 parents, it was, ta it was taken Boston. off. It was just, just Boston, but it was taken off. It was great. Boston Herald picked it up, right? So I'm on Match, I'm like, gosh, we got to build this thing out, we got to do this, you're, right? You're on, you're on Match figuring out how to make Sitter City better. Exactly. Uh, taking screenshots, you know, undercover. No picture, right? My, my profile was a, a story about how my sister Madeline liked to pretend she was a horse. I mean, who would write me? And then Dan wrote me. And I'm like, if this man would write me off of this profile, he's a keeper, we're going we're gonna to meet, and we met. <laughs> We started dating. Now we're married. We have twins. But we, st <laughs> we started dating. And on date number three, like, he's just like, hey, let's watch a movie, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, let me pitch you. Let's talk about this startup. I've like, got the screenshots out. And he's like, who are, who are you really? Can we just talk? <laughs> like, it was awesome. But anyway, when the site started breaking, you know, he would fix it. So I became incredibly lucky there. But I literally would do anything I could to make the site look bigger than it was. I mean, people would call, and they got so sick of just getting me on the first ring. And it was like me and a laptop, right? I mean, usually in a practice room at Northwestern, because I was getting a master's in opera at the time, they would call, and I'd be like, hello, this is Claire. You know, and they'd say, is Genevieve there? I'd be like, just a minute, let me get her. And I'd leave for a second, and then I'd be like, hello, this is Genevieve. <laughs> and, 
And it worked. They were like, oh, you're getting bigger. I'm like, you are, we're getting bigger. You know, like. I, I don't even know this Claire is. There's so many people here. Right, right. Claire's a new hire. I have a secretary now. I mean, it was hilarious. And then we, oh my gosh, like we would send letters and I would send them from Helen. Like we had like at one point like an HR rep. <laughs> How many personas did you have? Real. You had so multiple, many people multiple on Mac and so multiple many employees. <laughs> Which one do you want to talk to? No, How many, many employees, one social security number? <laughs> It's like a little community. No, but I just seriously, it was so funny because you had you had to build up trust in so many ways. It wasn't just that you had to like convince the moms, the sitters were there that it was great. You also had to convince them there was real live people behind the site that cared. And then you had to convince them it was more than just one. I mean, there were so many elements. And then if they found out, you had to convince them that, hey, we're just, I'm just trying to make my business work. <laughs> right, right. I'm okay. I, you know, but I mean, it, it worked. It worked, and it's great, and you got to do it. I love it. your resourcefulness. There's no way, you know. This is, this is resourceful. It's because I, I was an actress, right? Exactly. Out of my mind. All right, so let's talk about, so you 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 bootstrap for how many years? Uh, four, five. Bootstrap and then seed, you know, we friends got and seed family. Funding, we got seed funding in 05, and that was friends and family. And we actually raised, raised about... It was 2.2 in the end that we raised with seed funding. So that was across like was I two years. Was I 2A in that? Uh, mm, yes, possibly. possibly. I don't think, I don't know. But I think they I mean, came two million is a lot of, you know, seed funding. It was a lot of funding. Yeah, we did well. We actually um, had a couple family funds come together. Um, and we just kept pitching and pitching, and they kept seeing the growth. <laughs> so we got half a mil, and then we got the rest of it in a second chunk. We were making $3.2 million a year in revenue by the time we took our Series A, which was bizarre. Right. And the reason why was that when Sitter City launched, we were in the middle of the dot-com crash. You could not say dot-com until right. like 05. You couldn't say it. Everyone runs screaming Matt through. McCall, who's a venture capitalist, yeah. very successful venture capitalist here in town, referred to it as, he said it was commonly referred to as nuclear winter. Nuclear winter. Right. It was crazy. So you couldn't say it. So then I remember... All of a sudden, we started getting Today Show, getting these big shows, and then suddenly it shone the spotlight on the industry, and suddenly you couldn't say dot-com enough. So it was interesting. I mean, it really did grow. But anyway, we were, we were growing very carefully. But because we could not get funding, except in this haphazard seed funding way, we did not raise our Series A until 08. <laughs> We, we actually went through the frothy period of 07 where everybody wanted to buy everybody else. We had like, we had like 12 offers, right? It was crazy. So talk a little bit about this time because yeah. you had an offer that sort of you got down the aisle, but it didn't go all. We it, did. Well, we had t like 12 offers, right, from really well-known companies. And one of them was a Fortune 50, and we just, we were like, you know, stars in our eyes. We were like, whoa. But we did really want to raise funding and grow the business. So we decided we would... Uh, chase down the one Fortune 50, because we had to go through due diligence anyway, but we'd do it alongside you know, uh, a syndicate, raising with a syndicate of two VC firms on the other side you know, to, to get the Series A, which at that point was, was five mil. We, in retrospect, we probably could have raised more at that point, but whatever, it was five mil. So anyway, um, thousands of documents were changing hands. It was a fucking exactly, crazy exactly time. Exactly when is this? Oh, seven. Okay. It was the height of the bubble. Uh -huh. and, and now I know what a bubble is. Now I know what a recession is. Now I know what a bubble is. It's great stuff, right? We're learning every day. But I was just like, this is, this is weird, but I like it. Everybody had this irrational exuberance. So anyway, we did chase down the deal with the Fortune 50, which took a year. Um, and that's what they don't tell you. It takes a year. They're like, a couple months. It takes a year, right? And then we were, we were running the VC stuff alongside it. And... The day the stock purchase agreement showed up on my desk, Lehman went down. So doors slammed across the country. It was amazing. The call went up. I was talking to the CEO of a Fortune 50, or, or uh, the CEO of the division I was talking to. He was basically like, this, is, this can't happen. Did you read the news? And so that was horrifying. I remember just going into a numb state of shock. So we got immediately on the phone with the VCs and said, great, let's close. Let's do this. We've been, we've been talking about it forever. All the diligence is done. We had like three more documents, right? The diligence was basically done. And one of them pulled out and was like, oh, we're going to need to renegotiate. And to this day, I'll never forget what happened with the other because I'd made this really great relationship with Sean Marsh of Point Judith Capital, and he was the other VC. We had worked so hard together. He was a great stand-up guy. And I had just, I think he just was impressed with what we'd done and how hard I'd fought. And he kicked the other VC firm off the phone, just yelled at them, kicked them off the phone. 
And uh, ironically, it was a woman, too. I was trying to work with a woman. I was like, I found a woman VC. And then this happened. I'm like, oh, no. So anyway, kicked her off the phone. He sent me on a road trip to a bunch of other cities to find um, another VC firm. And, and I remember the only time I wasn't shaking, like literally like palsy shaking, I almost had a nervous breakdown, was when I was in meetings. Like I was literally beyond the plane. Like I couldn't stop shaking. And like Dan was with me and he was just like, you okay there? You need a blanket? Like literally for like a month, you know. I would get into the meeting. We were amazing. And then I would get out and I would shake again. So anyway, we finally got back to Chicago. And I ended up on a panel with Lon Chow with Apex Partners. And Lon was like, I'll do it. You know, so we closed like the next day, closed it over Thanksgiving. And that was the basis for like the best VC team ever. You know, two years later, we actually raised our Series B. We brought in Martin Clifford, who's the new CEO, back at the Series A. He was immensely helpful. He actually went on the road with us to help us close it. So we have this unusual situation where we, we have a really tight board and a really great group of people. And we actually had that weird trust exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, actors do trust falls. We have to do trust falls with each other. So that, you know, you trust your cast member. This was like the worst trust fall ever. <laughs> and it was great, you know. So, so, you know, we ended up with a great board. You know, our Series B, which Martin did a lot of raising. He was um, with me. He was COO for two years while I was CEO. And then I transitioned out um, as per we had a plan. Um, and he, um, he raised most of the Series B, and that was Bear Adventure Partners and, uh, and uh, JB's uh, uh, fund, uh, New World. So it's a great team. So it's talk, great. talk a little bit, if you would, about that decision to mm -hmm. transition out and mm -hmm. bring Martin in and then promoting him. Um, you know, we had, this, uh, um, we had this conversation a few times. You know, Chris Gladwin, this is now, there's yeah. a number of people who that's um, happened to. How did it happen for you, and how has it been? It's been great in retrospect. It was excruciating to do it. There's no other way. Um, when you build a company, it's like your kid. You know, I mean, I had no kids at the time. Now I do. <laughs> I've got three kids, right? You know, uh, and, and it just, you know, I've got Ari and Leo and then Cinder City. And it was just the hardest thing in the world. I had a very gentle team. They were wonderful. Like, they, there was no pushing. There was no... There was none of that. There was just support, but also like when I was hitting walls, they would pull, they would say, Jen, I think you're hitting a wall here. Like they were, they were honest, but kind. And I was very lucky. I hit some walls near the end. I, it just got so big. We were expanding internationally, um, chasing the Department of Defense deal, which we got due to a brilliant employee named Melissa Anderson, who was just Talk, talk about that deal, because this is a oh, game yeah. changer for you all. Oh, it was a huge game changer. The whole Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Uh, Melissa really pulled it off. I mean, she just... Did they have an RFP for this? Or oh, did you yeah. Have to go they had an RFP, and we went after it for years. You have to go after those for a couple of years. First, to convince them. They, we first had to teach them what it was then convince them that they needed it, and then convince them it was us, you know, because that point, the you know, around classic evangelical old, sale. Right, and I'm an evangelist, and it's so hard because by the time you get in there and by the time you, you've got their attention, of course there's copies. So all those copies are doing what they can to look better. So then you've got to convince them it's you. So Melissa did this spectacular move and closed the sale. But it was, it was just a crazy, crazy time, you know. It's all about your team. I knew Martin was the right guy, and that was wonderful. I knew I was hitting walls, and I knew I needed to transition out. So in general, it was pretty gentle. I needed to be very honest with myself. There was no push. There was just a very gentle, gosh, this is just not working. I was unhappy. So I stepped out, I think. You know, we, we did it so gradually. We wanted to be so careful with the team. I was president for six months while Martin was CEO. Like, we, we did this whole crazy long transition, probably longer than we needed to, but we just wanted to ease everybody through it. And then finally, Dan and I stepped up on the board, but we literally had an office there for months to make sure it was okay. So it was great. But um, for, How many people are there now? Oh, gosh, 80, 90. Uh, but then the part-timers, you know, over 100 really working here. And, and how, many, how many members, or how do you describe your... Oh, gosh, millions, millions and millions of users. Um, I, I wish I, I should have looked up the numbers, sorry. <laughs> that was silly, but millions and millions. Uh, and, you know, tens of millions have probably used it. You know, it's, it's just such a great resource. You know, it's funny, too. I, I will say, like, for anyone that does have to go through a switch out, it's really the first year after that's the hard part. I've had twins, 
and that didn't help. Really? <laughs> I would think that was a real yeah. thing, right? Yeah, you know, right. So it's like that combined with leaving. I mean, it just was such a shock to the system. Right. You know, I went from literally flying to six talk shows a year to sitting ordering cribs like on my couch, like crying for no reason. You know, it's just crazy. But you know, I pulled myself together, and now I, I realized there was a path I'd never followed that I'd always wanted to, and that I had a chance to. And so I've been chasing that down for three years, and it's been a blast. I want to go to some of the audience questions here. Um, so let's start with how do you pick people early on? How did you pick people to come work with you on the idea? Like the early people mm -hmm. who came in, how'd you pick them? What'd you learn about picking? Oh yeah. Well, companies shed their skin like snakes. It's crazy. So you you have to you're going to hire people that are less expensive but rising stars first, of course. Mm -hmm. Once you get that first seed round or that Series A, you're going to hire the best people you can, but you are not going to be able to afford rock stars. Mm -hmm. So hire them, but know they're going to be around for probably two years. And right? Who are, who are the best hires and and the mistakes you made hiring very early on? What 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 what? <sighs> Well, I think my, my mistake was, and I don't even know if it was a mistake, it was just the way it happened. I just didn't know companies shed their skin. So it's excruciating when you outgrow that first crop because then you have another crop coming in because you've got more money and you get your Series A or your Series B, and then you hire the superstars. You go and you poach from here or there and you take the best in, and then you get this second team which blows everything up. And, and it's funny, I mean, like, I had amazing people through every phase. I had amazing emerging stars. Thankfully, a number of those went on naturally to other careers, so that was amazing. But then when we brought in the superstars, it's interesting because you know, you'll know you poach superstars in various different areas. Often they'll only stay for two years, but if they stay for longer, you're gonna outgrow them too. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then you've got the various mentalities you have to deal with. Are you an innovator? Are you a scientist? And then you have to take these you know, kind of polls of like, do I have too many scientists, too many innovators? Like, what's our culture like? You, you really have to focus near the end on having that weird but essential balance between scientists who just tweak and fix very slowly and innovators will just blow something up mm -hmm. and see what happens and then rebuild, it's, it's hard. So what do you think Sitter City can be? One of the questions is about the future. Mm -hmm. You've got the revenue streams where you are. Um, you know, is this, what, what, what's your vision for where you think this can go? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, the rest of the world needs it. <laughs> we're working on that. And we're in a lucky situation. I mean, because of the fact that we started when we started, we really only have one competitor, which came out as a copy of us in 06 and really, really ran. They've taken a slightly different path, but it's nice, you know, it's a neck and neck kind of situation. And then there's a smaller, more innovative, you know, competitor as well. So we watch them. We're very respectful of our competitors. We try to create a good ecosystem. But you know, what I'd say is this is a wonderful situation. It's not like the dating service industry where you got like 10, you know, all duking it out and like, you know, eating up all the revenue. There's just two. So once we really saturate the US, the UK, the Canadian markets, which are the really biggest fish, there's obviously a lot of other markets that need this. Australian markets, European markets, gosh, I mean, it's essential. I mean, when we look at China and Japan, I was just knee deep in articles about China and how that, that area is changing and what what they need and you have to just kind of surf the trends and enter at the right time. I also think there's a lot of innovation to be done. I've been seeing some very interesting stuff in terms of sensory based flooring, sensory based rooms, smart rooms that know where the child is, know if it's dropped liquid, know where it's going mm. as it travels. So you can watch on a GPS, there's the child, there it is moving. That's very good. Wow. Not to say that should ever take the place of someone, but when those things start to merge, you know, smart rooms with the physical person, right? Um, you know, it's it gets more and more exciting. Any good nanny cam stories? <laughs> no, you know, I was just gonna say, nanny cams. I mean, that's just a controversy in and of itself. I've done a million articles on nanny cams and, and interviews, and it's really just do you or don't you tell the caregiver that they're there? And I always say, say there is one, even if there isn't, right? <laughs> You know, I don't know, Where? but that's more of a joke. But what I was going to say is, are you aware there's robot babysitters now in Japan? Like, I'm not. No. Yeah, and they actually watch. They're like a, an amazingly sophisticated version of nanny cams. I geek out on this stuff. I, I go find these robots. I'm so fascinated. But they literally will move around like with heat sensors and know 
where the child is and they'll follow it and they'll, the parent, <laughs> this is funny, the parent can sometimes speak through the robot, which is creepy. There was, a, there was a Microsoft experiment that went terribly wrong with a bear that was, a, that was a, a, like a nanny cam and the mom or dad could speak through the bear like Teddy Roxman with mommy's voice and the kid was like, ah, like all the videos. So that didn't go quite well. Onwards and upwards, right? We keep innovating. But I mean, there are, there are really weird things happening right now with nanny cams where it's far more than just sound and video, where it's actual movement and tracking. And it'll all probably, you know, move along with the, you know, the, the movements already towards smart, smart homes and smart do rooms. Do you think, um, you know, do you see this space evolving or is this such a fun, in, in a more fundamental way or is it incremental? I mean, because this is such, in a lot of ways, this is a very fundamental transaction. The fundamental drivers of it trust what you're looking for, yeah. et cetera, seem consistent? Or do you see this being, is this, is this a slow evolving space from this point on? Or do you see there being no. seismic shifts out there? I think seismic shifts. So, so you really have still this bastion of the old world, which is, you know, you've still got nanny agencies. People still use them. It's different now, but you still got them. And then you've got daycares. And basically, the industry is, is a big you know, schism between in-home care and out-of-home care. And these two sides are not married, and they are going to have to marry. And we've seen that for the longest time, and they're starting to. I mean, Bright Horizons is our partner for the corporate program. So when we watch the industry, it's really fascinating to see, okay, this company could build a thousand dollar, you know, sorry, pardon me, thousand dollar, million dollar daycare in their headquarters and have three other locations and desperately to try, try to serve, you know, 15% of the employee's children. Or what you can do is a hybrid. Uh, hybrids are wonderful where you actually have, you know, maybe it's a daycare at a different location which is used as a drop-in when you need it for an out-of-home, but the out-of-home is the last-ditch option once you've exhausted the in-home options. Hmm. There, there needs to be kind of a coming together. Almost like a layered. Approach. Yeah, I mean, because there is so much cost on this side and they're very entrenched. And, and they know it and we're all talking. It's great. But the, it just, you, it, this guy needs to sort of fall a little bit and kind of, not fall, but like kind of crunch itself into a more uh, market-friendly shape. Mm -hmm. And then over here, we actually need to grow so that we can facilitate what they need to kind of make their costs work. But it's just funny when you watch these massive, you know, um, massive industry makers over on the daycare side and the, the nanny agency side, you know, trying to wrap their heads around this incredibly, you know, a scalable, mobile, you know, kind of well, it's, it's, option. It's an interesting disruption. I mean, yeah. you know, you think about Uber and some of these other disruptions, but what's interesting mm -hmm. about it is there's a cost. It's like schools. There's a cost incentive mm -hmm. to put all the kids in a room and yeah. toys. But there's a price, right? Kids get sick very easily from doing that. They yeah. learn lots of bad habits. I always say, you know, in the summer you can pick out the daycare kids because they're a little, <laughs> little, they're a little less um, they're sweet and innocent. They've been, they, they've, <laughs> well, yes, they've been around the sick. block. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting, and so, um, but I do think that this is, it's an interesting question, which is you get into a distributed model. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen this one that just got 44 million from Andreessen Horowitz, the, you know, peer-to-peer -peer shopping. Yeah. There's all, all kinds of interesting, yeah. Instacart it's called. There's all kinds of interesting ways. Yeah. Um, do you think that the, does this mean that this sort of model that you're talking about, in addition, you've disrupted the nanny agency already, the caregiver yeah. agency. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in a major way. Do you see that maybe this, um, could move even more and more of it being served in a peer-to-peer -peer way than it's been in the past? Oh, Will absolutely. you start going at the daycare market? Absolutely. I mean, you know, Uber's a model everybody's eyeing. You know, it's, it's just made everything so wonderfully <laughs> useful. But I guess, I guess the thing is there's just such a modular approach, you know, in the out-of-home care where you've got these specific locations you bring the child to. That's what we're really trying to fix. I mean, perhaps someday, you know, it's not that you bring your child there, it's that somebody can come there or not based on whether you need someone in home or out. It just needs to break down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, for us, we see so many opportunities, particularly in the training. I mean, the, the training processes over here in the out-of-home care world are, are monstrously um, expensive, whereas for us, we actually have, all we've already built it, and it's so inexpensive for us, just simply merging those two. Mm -hmm. You know, we find nanny agencies and daycares, they source all their caregivers from us, so let's promote that, let's make right. that work. Good, it just this this, this is a really good example, by the way, of you have to be passionate about what you're doing. When people say, you know, what should I do? A lot of times people say, I'm going to go with an interesting, this is an interesting space. 
If you don't really get passionate about doing it, you can't, you're not gonna change it and you can't persist. Yeah. And I think that's one of the real, um, the real tricks of this is you can see how passionate you are even now. I'm a babysitting geek. <laughs> <laughs> I want one of those babysitting robots just to follow me around and be like, she's eating, she's eating right now. She's sleeping. So <laughs> Tell the world. Three, three final questions. Um, the first one is, um, if you had to say to a young entrepreneur or first time entrepreneur of any age, Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you had to do it all over again, the best advice, whether something that worked or something that didn't work, what would be the thing that you'd say, boy, next time I would definitely do this differently, or next time I would definitely do this again? Okay, Different well, opportunity. the thing I'd say that I think is most critical is I, I would have learned to code. I, I only recently have learned, and it changes everything. Right now, you're going out with a company, you're going to need, you know, 120 k just to get just to get it built, because you're gonna need the website, you're gonna need the iPhone app, it's like 80-40, you know, right mm -hmm. there. And, and you gotta build it all, and then it's gonna break. You gotta have somebody on retainer, 10, $20,000 a month just fixing bugs. Why? You know, if I could go back, what I would do is I'd put myself through Starter League, you know, Neil Starter League or Code Academy or something like that, and I would have simply learned back and front end coding. I, you know, it's not even that hard. You learn Ruby on Rails so that you have something that's mobile compatible, and that's the back end stuff. And then on the front end, you have to learn basically CSS, JavaScript, a little bit of MySQL, and you're there. You can build a CSS style sheet, you can build a front end, you just attach it to the back end. I even would have geeked out on server arrays and understood, you know, how, how those now I understand everything but like you know I, I would have understood what I needed and where I, I just I would have done it very differently I would have really bulked up on the tech side and um, that's what I'm encouraging many 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 people to do right now the resources are here if you can take a couple of classes at Starter League or it's free at Code Academy but Starter League is nice because it has that I'm not selling it's just there's different options I find it's good to have projects that you've worked through. Mm -hmm. So whatever you do, just get a project that you can work through. Come on out, build your proof of concept. It's gonna cost you maximum like $16,000 for the classes. When you put that opposite, the 120, 140,000 you're gonna need just to get started, it's worth it. And right. it'll cost you eight months of your life. So come on out, build your own proof of concept, and then you're gonna have to run after everybody and sell it, but at least you have a real sense of what's going on and it will make you Dangerous. So you've been a great mentor here at 1871. You mentor a lot of entrepreneurs, both women and men. Yeah. Um, I know you spend a lot of time though, particularly with women entrepreneurs. I try, although um, I, I'm happy to mentor anybody. Yeah. Um, but talk a little bit about um, your view on Chicago for entrepreneurs today. I think it's fantastic. Um, I think, frankly, personally, I think it's there's no better place to be. And I guess that's par partially because Sitter City succeeded here even when even when there wasn't this ecosystem, we still had real champions. There are heroes here that will help you. That you don't really find that in other markets. But you know, once you see 1871 and the CEC board behind it, all pushing to make this happen. You know, now it just you know with with the fact that we've got like so many companies involved and companies graduating. I mean, this is a great ecosystem. The thing that I think is most exciting about Chicago is the fact that there's a lot of transparency. You can talk to any founder. You can just literally find Chuck Templeton in the hall, chase him down and be like, hey dude, question, and ask him. We'll give you the formulas. We've built the formulas. There's only 10 ways to build a web mobile company. Mm -hmm. We've seen them all. They're here in 1871. So if there's only 10 ways to do it, stands to reason if you chase somebody down who's built one of them, they're gonna tell you how. We tell, we tell here in this market in Boston or San Fran or New York, I've seen a lot of go figure it out for yourself. That's not going to help anybody. I heard a great quote today, which is that the, the defining characteristic of startup culture in particular, and I think it's very true mm. here, is the willingness to help complete strangers. Mm -hmm. And part of it is the desire to sort of give back, pay it forward. And part of it is yeah. that entrepreneurs are, by definition, problem solvers. You're like, what problem are you trying to solve? I'll help you solve a problem. Like, I'm, I, know. I like solving problems. I know. It gets you going, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like another problem that's not the problem I'm on for the last four hours. Great. Give exactly. it to me. Let's solve that one. It'll take exactly. two minutes, you know? It'll be like fun to go play with. Feels exactly. good, you know? I, I know. So there's, and there's a geeky culture here where we're all problem solvers, so we're all jumping all over each other to solve problems. It's just such a great energy, mm -hmm. and there's champions. Yep. Oh, you're champion. I mean, you got JB, you got, you got real champions here that are really fighting, first of all, to create the ecosystem that's going to attract in even bigger and better stuff than we already have, because we've got a lot of funding, we've got a lot of capital. 
but you know, it's just gonna get bigger as we begin to churn out more and more very successful, highly scalable, fast growing companies. So uh, any companies you're particularly excited about up and coming that you put wanna put on people's radar that you've worked with? Oh, sure. Um, you know, I, well, I, you know, they happen to be women run ones at the moment just cause I've Great. been focusing on, you know, helping out. They're, they don't tend to be as many women and that's partially our fault and partially <laughs> the way that we grow up. But, you know, uh, we're working on that. We're on it and we're really, you know, determined. So, I mean, I, I love Moxie Jean. I think Sharon Schneider is amazing. I mean, Desiree and Give Forward is a rock star company. Um, I really like um, Gift Bar, Kara Kaplan. Um, I think they're really, really smart. Uh, let's see, who else have I talked to lately? Um, I think Coco Mears is really onto something with Pretty Quick. A couple pivots there because, geez, the spa world is hard to get through. But there's, there's just a lot of really interesting women's issues that I think have really not been addressed just because nobody's really gotten in there and been like, no, this is a big, big deal. I had a girl pitch me the other day. She's like, yeah, she's really embarrassed, right? The way I used to be. I used to be like, hey, it's a babysitting company. We're cute. You know, throw us in the line. No, you know, like she was like, yeah, I found a way to make your nails dry in two minutes. And I'm like, well, I could create about four companies in the time that, you know, my nail, you'd save me on my nails. Great, bring it in, you know. And she was embarrassed. She was apologizing. We need to stop apologizing. I think women need to look around for the inconveniences we face and fix them. And, and that's what's happening with, with Coco and with, with you know, Moxygene and all these great companies I'm mentioning. They're going in there and they're finding those. So I happen to be a bit niche with this sort of thing. It's not just moms, it's more like women's stuff that might have just been considered something we were just supposed to kind of deal with. Go find it. Turn it into a billion dollar industry. That's your opportunity. Go for it. Well, you know, the, one of the latest companies that Andreessen Horowitz just funded, they basically said it's P and G for African Americans, and the reason awesome, is right? P and G does a crappy job of building products that are built for them for some of the different yeah. needs people have. And they said it's an unmet market, it'll Opening. really go. Yeah. And and the entrepreneur is a really impressive um, young guy, and he's he's got this mm -hmm. angle. And but here's the thing, he said, well, shouldn't I be just starting P and G? And they said everything starts with a niche. Everything starts with a niche. That's like, true. You you really do need a niche. And, and the narrower the niche, the better. I mean, right. every entrepreneur, including myself, has made this starry-eyed mistake of, I'm going to solve this massive problem. It never works. Never Just, starts. The, 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 I mean, listen, Amazon started with books. And right, it was, right, you know, yeah. It was a, it was a, it was a niche yeah. book player and it was a niche space on top of it. So there's no no question. Keep it simple, simple, stupid. Martin says it. Simple, stupid. I always like that phrase. Well, you've, you've been a great mentor. One last thing, which is you're, you're a great entrepreneur. You're still on the board of Sitter City and a mm -hmm. big shareholder. You are a great mentor here in Chicago in 1871. But there's one more thing that we should share, which is, well, you, you no longer need to wait tables to do this if you want to pursue <laughs> this God. career. You are pursuing one of your dreams here, as you already got your master's in opera at Northwestern, but you're pursuing one of your dreams here. To wrap up, share with everybody what you're doing. Sure. Well, I just never really felt like I gave something a fair shake in my life. I've been a performer my whole life. Actually, I've always suffered from really major stage fright, crippling stage fright, actually. And um, after having twins, it got a lot better because after having twins, you're like, okay, I'm ready for anything. But like, it was funny. I, I never really, I used to get in front of people and my fear would kind of not translate I could not get across what I could do in an audition, you know, and I can, I'm a high color tour, I can sing glitter and be gay, but the, you know, can't get up to those notes when you're afraid. So I took a break, went out, founded Sitter City for a while, and now I've just decided I need to go for it. I know that on my deathbed, you know, I'm gonna be like, did I do that thing that scared me more than anything in the world? And this is it. So for the last three years, I've been retraining as an actress, singer, um, I've done a ton of things in the area. I just sang a solo at Pritzker Pavilion. That was great. I just did a, a I was um, North China Lover with Looking Glass Theater, um, doing a lot of great work with Goodman. Um, actually, <laughs> so uh, we missed our latest meeting to prep for this call because I was in with Broadway's biggest casting agent, a wonderful guy named Jay Binder. And um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it work, but it was just the most wonderful thing. It was the national tour of Sister Act, and that was wonderful. And so, you know, I'm really making, like, apparently they all think I'm a nun. That's awesome. You think of yourself in a red dress, singing with a feather in your hair. No, you never know what you're, they're going to see you as. And apparently, I'm a spectacular nun, but whatever. Um, I'm, I'm going out, and I'm really chasing this dream. 
and I'm playwriting as well to kind of like round it out. I figure if the roles aren't out there, at least the non-roles non aren't out there, I'll write the roles. So I've got a musical that's debuting at the Greenhouse Theater on July 29th. It's in its Ooh. second reading. Uh, so so it's, it's pretty much complete. Um, it's been a huge undertaking, two years. Um, Brilliant composer, Misha Zuko, he's awesome. And then I've got a play that hopefully will go up in readings at the Owen and, and the Goodman soon. So tons of stuff going on where I've just been able to really get into this world and do what I wasn't able to do before. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us, Jenna. It's great. Thanks. <laughs>